Happy Thursday. Welcome to Basis Juice presented by Point to Bet Sportsbook. I'm the prop queen, Ariel Epstein. I've got a few I told you so moments. If you've been listening to the show, something happened yesterday. Actually, two things happened yesterday that I just saw the future. One thing happened yesterday that really pissed me off. I've also got best bets that I'm sure some will piss me off after today. Uh, That'll be at the end of the show. The first thing that I predicted, the Angels were going to shut down their two-way all-star Shohei Otani on the mound. It made no sense to play him. At least to pitch him on the mound. Otani was already tired. You saw it in his last full start. Misses his last start. Otani gets pulled, doesn't even make it through the second inning yesterday. Reportedly a torn UCL in his right elbow. The Angels lost that game 9-4. to Regardless, the Angels lost way more than just a two-game sweep in a doubleheader yesterday to the Reds. It's the second time now that Otani has suffered an, an, a UCL tear. Sorry, not ACL. UCL tear. Otani had Tommy John surgery that year. It was back in 2018. Wasn't able to pitch in 2019. The Angels are waiting on a second opinion regarding surgery. Here's what I said about a week ago about Shohei Otani. At what point do we shut down Shohei Otani on the mound? I know Otani doesn't want to shut himself down on the mound. He's such a team player. He wants to go for the playoffs. The Angels seem so far out of it. If I don't think the Yankees are going to get into the third wild card spot, why on earth would I think the Angels would? Otani needs to save himself to make his big bucks. If Otani does something stupid by pitching and hurting himself in September, where it really isn't going to matter at that point, why? Everyone knows you can pitch well. Everyone knows you can hit well. I see Otani making one or two more starts this year. Then they're going to say, no more. One more start. That's all I got. Shut him down. Torn UCL. What is this going to do for Otani in the free agency market? He's not going to be poor. I'm not complaining for what Otani's going to make. Still probably will be a record-breaking deal. These teams have to ask now. Can Otani pitch next year? Do we want to sign Otani to a one-year deal? Are we going to give Otani a 10-year deal now with two UCL tears? If we sign Otani, is Otani going to only be able to pitch for the next three to five years until he can only be a DH for the rest of his career? Otani's been incredible this season. Going to win a second MVP. Had top five ERA strikeouts, opponent batting average in baseball. We know he could pitch. How much longer can he go? Otani, what he's doing is amazing. It's not sustainable. There's a reason nobody else has done what Otani's done. The body can't handle it. It shocked me that Otani even made it through as far as he did this season, through almost the end of August pitching as well as he has. One start is what is going to essentially not hurt Otani, but the money might take a hit. The years on his contract might take a hit. I might not be willing. If I'm a baseball team who's going to do some record-breaking number, do I want to be stuck with that for 10 years when Otani may not even be able to go as a pitcher for that long? The reason you're paying Otani so much money is because he could do two things. He hits and he pitches at a very high level. Pitching at a high level may only happen for the next three years. That one start. A lot of question marks now. Regardless of the question marks, Otani stayed in both games of the doubleheader yesterday. Otani in game one, after being taken out of the game with a torn UCL, homers, and pitches in the same game for the seventh time this year. That two-run shot put him ahead of the Braves' first baseman, Matt Olson for the MLB lead with home runs. Game two, Otani doubles and scored as the Angels DH. Um, So, again, Otani amazing in every aspect. Just is he going to be paid to be a pitcher and a hitter for 10 years? Going to find out in the offseason because the Angels are out of this race, especially because they put their other all-star, Mike Trout, back on the I.L., Trout was reinstated from the IL on Tuesday after missing 38 games with a hammy fracture in his left hand, went one for four with an infield single, then had pain in his hand when he was batting. Trout suffered the injury on July 3rd, 
had the hook of his left hamate bone removed on July 5th. Back on the IL. Trout's a three-time AL MVP, 11-time All-Star, hitting 263, 18 homers, 44 RBI in 82 games. Angels GM, Perry Manassian, he said the team believes Trout came back too early. Yeah, no kidding. They expect him to come back this year. Why? The Angels are 10 and a half games back of the AL wild card race. Let Otani just hit. Put Mike Trout on the IL. Mike Trout is back to being the face of your organization. Otani's not staying. Otani's out. Gone. Mike Trout doesn't have many years left in the league. He has been hurt every season. Trout's not coming back. You're out of the race. See ya. The Yankees are also out of the race. They are about nine and a half, ten and a half games back still of the AL. Yesterday, another moment I was right. The Yankees won. Thank you to the sports books for handing us the answers to the test. You had the Yankees minus 140 on a nine-game losing streak with their worst pitcher of the season, their righty, Luis Severino on the mound, who has an ERA of just below an eight, the second worst in baseball. Minus 140. Yankees won. The Yankee slugger, Aaron Judge, their MVP. Six of the Yankees' nine runs. We're from Aaron Judge. Drove him in. Career best three home run game, including a grand slam for Judge. 27 homers for Aaron Judge this year, despite missing 43% of the Yankees games. Judge still leads the Yankees in home runs. Fifth most in the American League. Judge has been on pace to have one of the best seasons ever. He just got hurt. In the last 13 games, Judge, 4-11 on base percentage, 7 homers, 11 RBI, 9 runs scored. He's the best player on the Yankees. He's the only player on the Yankees, Aaron Judge. Prior to the game, Yankees general manager Brian Cashman described the Yankees as a, quote, disaster. Here's Cashman before the game. How much of a shock has the losing been to you and your staff? It's a, you know, it's been a disaster this season. Um, and yeah, it's a, definitely a shock. Uh, certainly, uh, I don't think anybody on our side of the fence, uh, from our player group, from our coaches, our manager, um, or even outside the organization, saw would have predicted this. So, aside from the injuries, where do you think things have gone wrong? Uh, well, it's we're going to evaluate it all. Clearly, got uh, uh, unfortunately, we're going to have some time to do that. Um, but I'd say everybody's had a little bit of a hand in it, you know, um, from top to bottom, and it's our job to find out where. Um, you know, obviously, that's what we're going to be up to and tasked with. Uh, you know, I certainly met with Hal Steinbrenner on several occasions already, and, and um, you know, this is not something we're accustomed to or used to, or, and I think, you know, there's definitely going to be a lot of internal assessments going on. No one saw this coming, Cashman? I saw it coming last year. I saw it coming at the beginning of this year. The Yankees got to the ALCS last season. They beat the Guardians in five out of five for an ALDS. The CS, I said there's no chance they're beating the Astros. They're going to get destroyed. They're going to be embarrassed. If I knew that last year, and all they did was add some more injured players. The lefty Carlos Rodon, who is hit or miss, who hasn't played most of this season. How did you not see this coming? The Yankees have been, yes, to the ALCS, which has been the worst thing to happen to the Yankees in the last five years is making it to the ALCS because they keep thinking they're going to get away with structuring this lineup the same way that they did in 09. It doesn't work. You haven't won a World Series in over a decade. That's the status. That's what you need to hit, Yankees. And Brian Cashman sitting here saying, yeah, it's a disaster. We're not used to this. You're not used to it. I don't care that you've made the ALCS. You haven't won a World Series. You should have been striving for that. You've gotten worse. Haven't traded away any key pieces of your, of your uh, farm system because you were so convinced this was the next up-and-coming wave of the Yankees. 
aside for Aaron Judge, who has come through this farm system that has been successful? Luis Severino? He's got a, the second worst DRA in baseball. Anthony Volpe's been carrying this team, and he's barely hitting above 250. On opening day, the Yankees had just over 81% chance of getting to the playoffs. The Yankees were minus $4 to make the playoffs. The Yankees are so far out of this race, nine and a half games back of the wild card, they have a 0.2% chance of making it to the playoffs this year. I want the Yankees to finish in last place just so they know things have to change. It's been years in the making. I have watched this decline. When I knew that they couldn't even compete in the ALCS last year, I knew there was a problem. And so should the Yankees organization. If only the Yankees could draft and scout and make trades like the Baltimore Orioles. Mostly the drafting, scouting, and development because the Orioles have done a heck of a job. They just beat the Blue Jays 7-0 yesterday, plus 115 on the money line as a home underdog. The Orioles continue to win as a home dog. I was mad yesterday because I really liked the Orioles. The Orioles had a pitching change. They end up going with Dean Kramer instead of Jack Flaherty, so I end up being off the game. Baltimore's right fielder Anthony Sander homered, Santander homered twice despite missing three days with a back issue. The righty Dean Kramer threw six innings of five-hit ball. Baltimore extended its streak of not being swept in a series to 80. The Orioles maintain a two-game lead in the AL East over the Tampa Bay Rays. As for Toronto, they fall one game behind Seattle for the final wild card spot. Orioles are now 9-3 and three this season against the Blue Jays. Baltimore's minus 300 to win the AL East, third shortest odds to win the American League at plus 370. Despite being the one seed, the Orioles are still the third shortest odds. You got Texas at plus 325, Houston plus 340. The Orioles are great. They're probably going to win the division. The Orioles may even get that first round bye. The Orioles are going to get home field advantage. It's not going to matter. The second the Orioles have to face the Astros, they lose. That's why you're seeing the Orioles with the third shortest odds to win the American League. Their starting rotation is not good enough. The Rangers' bullpen isn't good enough. Oh, I'll get to that. Disaster. The Astros are the most complete team. The Astros just need their bats to heat up at the right time. Orioles have the bats. Orioles have the bullpen. Starting pitching? You saw it yesterday. Toronto had their righty Kevin Gossman on the mound, made his fifth career start against his former team. He allowed two runs, five hits, nine Ks, one walk in six innings. Gosman leads the American League in strikeouts with 196. Gosman is the ace of the Blue Jays staff. That's why the Orioles were underdogs at home yesterday. I really, aside for a four or five pitcher of the Astros and the Rangers, the one, two, maybe even three pitchers on both Houston and Texas. Can't see the Orioles being favored with any of their starting pitchers in any of those playoff games. Orioles are a contender. They're not a World Series team. Another team, not a World Series team, playoff contender for sure, the Seattle Mariners. Their eight-game win streak got snapped yesterday with a 5-4 loss to the White Sox. White Sox were plus 205 on the money line. Total went under of 9.5. Game went to the 10th inning. It was crazy. Designated runner Tim Anderson stole third, scored the winning run on a Seattle throwing error. That was all on a failed pickoff play. It was another bad beat for an under. The total was 9.5. Score was 4-1 heading into the ninth inning. Mariners scored three runs in the top of the ninth. Takes a 4-3 lead. White Sox tied the game. Left fielder Andrew Vettatendi singles in the bottom of the ninth. Sends the games to extra innings. The White Sox then walked off on a throwing error when Anderson stole third. Brutal beat for an under. Brutal beat for Mariners money line betters. This is why you don't bet full game unders. That ghost runner in extra innings is a killer for any kind of full game under. First five unders only, full game overs. Speaking of bad beats, hmm. Imagine starting off your day so bad. Well, I guess it didn't really start the day. It was a 4 o'clock game here on the East Coast. I started off the night slate bad. I was ready to throw my, my TV off the wall. I even missed Aaron Judge's grand slam because I was watching this stupid game go to extra innings. The San Francisco Giants hold off the Phillies to win 8-6 in extra innings. 
Giants were plus 122 on the money line. The over was eight. I gave out Phillies money line. It was my favorite play of the afternoon slate yesterday. Phillies are one of the most profitable daytime teams. They are one of the most profitable daytime teams at home. Both those things happened yesterday. Why did the Phillies all-star Bryce Harper have to hit a game-tying three-run home run in the bottom of the ninth inning? Why did you do that to me? Just, just put me out of my misery if you're going to lose the game. I don't want to see you tie it. I don't care about how amazing this game was. Forget it. The same result happened whether he hit the home run or didn't. You lost, Philly. Phillies were down 5-2 to two heading into the ninth inning. Harper hits the home run off the right field foul pole. Game goes to extras, which, by the way, the Phillies did have runners in scoring position. Their third base coach ends up holding up. I forget who it was that was running to third base in the ninth inning. Holds him up with two outs. Go. Go home. It's a tie game. Go try to win. Nope. Holds him at third. Two outs. Game goes to extras. Giant shortstop Paul DeYoung had a memorable first day with the Giants. Two-run homer in the fourth. Game-winning two-run single in the tenth. Despite the win, the Giants are still half game back of the Reds for the final wild card spot. I guess that's their karma for ruining my day. The Chicago Cubs beat the Tigers 6-4. to four. Cubs were plus 105 on the money line. The total goes over eight. Cubs, uh, Cubs catcher Jan Gomes hit a tie-breaking two-out single in the eighth for the lead. The Cubs have won 24 of their last 34 games, took two of three from the Tigers, improving to 9-1-1 in their last 11 series. Cubs three and a half games back of the Brewers for the NL Central. They are plus 190 Chicago to win the division. The Cubs are in the second wild card spot in the NL with a half game lead over the Giants and the Diamondbacks. No value left on the Cubs to win or to make the playoffs. Last game, Padres shut out the Marlins 4 0. Padres were minus 130 on the money line. Total was 7.5, went under. Padres righty Seth Lugo allowed three hits in six innings. Shortstop Xander Bogart hit a two run homer for the Pods. San Diego took two of three from Miami. They're six games back of the wild card spot. Marlins now two games back of the last wild card spot. Still value on the Padres to make the playoffs. I just don't really have faith in the Marlins for making it. Coming up next, best bets for today. Stay here on Basis Juice. Welcome back to Basis Juice, presented by Points Bet Sportsbook. I've got picks. It's early action on the board tonight. Not a lot to choose from. Apologies if you're probably listening to this whole podcast by now. And the game's already started. Yankees Nationals are a 1 p.m. Eastern time game at Yankee Stadium. I am going to bet the Nationals plus one and a half, also plus 175 on the money line. Nationals lefty Patrick Corbin's 3-1 with a 3.67 ERA in his last seven starts. It's good for Corbin. He's been pitching better on the road, too. Grew up a Yankees fan from Syracuse. Corbin's got a 2.33 ERA in three games started against the Yankees in his career. The Nationals, they're 8-3 in their last 11 games, averaging just over five runs per game. The Nationals are the second most profitable afternoon team in baseball. Although they're just 26-27, and 27, which is 49%, You've made over $1,200 if you've been betting National Day games on the money line. 911 of those dollars were with the Nationals on the road in the daytime. Just because wins and losses aren't above 500 does doesn't mean it's not profitable. The Nationals are nearly 2-1 to one underdogs. The book continues to underbook Washington. They've been winning on the road. Seventh on the run line is the profit. That's because you're laying juice like you are today on the Nationals to get one and a half runs. That's cashed at 53%. You've only made 125 bucks though. 1200 versus 125 if you lay the run or if you take the runs on the run line. Nationals the third most profitable road team, up just under 18 units overall this year on the money line. Just under 13 units on the run line. That's overall on the road, not daytime. The stats before were about the day. This is on the road. Um, I just like the Nationals here, plus one and a half at Yankee Stadium. K-props don't always correlate to wins and losses. Nationals lefty Patrick Corbin take his under a four and a half Ks. In all eight games, seven of the eight games that Patrick Corbin's faced a low K rate team against lefties, Corbin's gone under this. Seven of eight. The Yankees have one of the lowest K rates in baseball against Southpaws. Southpaw's averaging just under 4Ks a game when starting against New York. 
They are 7-15 and 15 over under their K-prop lefty starters when facing the Yankees. Under 4.5 Ks on Patrick Corbin, Yankees hit lefties well top 10 in OPS. He may not even stay in the game long enough, or it's just a low-scoring game and he doesn't get the case. Rockies at the Rays. Totals 8.5. Bet the over. The Rays are averaging just over five runs a game at home. Tampa leads the American League in batting average and runs scored since July. Tampa's throwing a bullpen game. They've got their righty Sean Armstrong pitching, probably going to be followed by Erasmo Ramirez. Uh, Erasmo Ramirez, Ramirez 6-3-2 ERA in his last six outings. In the last two road games against Milwaukee and the Dodgers, Rockies righty Peter Lambert allowed at least three runs to each. The Rockies' bullpen is atrocious. The worst in baseball, 7-7-1 ERA since the beginning of August. Blew three straight games, the Rockies' bullpen. Tampa Bay, second most profitable team in baseball to the over when playing at home. You're up just over 12 units. 39-24-1 over under this year when playing at the Trop. Over in Rockies' race. Nighttime slate. I also like the over of nine runs in the Cubs and Pirates game. Chicago's averaging just below six runs a game since the beginning of June. Cody Bellinger, Hammer Candelario, Jamer Candelario, they're hitting above 340 in the last month. Pittsburgh, 618 rotation ERA. It's the worst in baseball since the beginning of July. Pittsburgh home overs, the most profitable in baseball, up just under 13 units. At PNC, the Pirates, 38. 23 and 2 over under this year. The wind also is going to benefit increase in runs, increase in homers, increase in extra base hits over in this Pirates game, uh, especially because of the trend with the Pittsburgh Pirates up against Chicago, who's been awesome offensively recently. There's a strikeout prop that's really fishy. I have been trying to say, oh my gosh, the book's giving us a layup. Let's go bet it. Every time I know the line is too low, something is up. That's what's happening in this Twins game. Twins righty Pablo Lopez, his strikeout prop six and a half. Lopez has had at least seven strikeouts in all 13 starts he has had against a high K rate team. Any team averaging five or more strikeouts against a righty starter, 13 of those Lopez has gone over. When that happens and the book's giving us a low number, something's up. Lines moving against Pittsburgh, uh, excuse me, lines moving against Minnesota. Texas is averaging five strikeouts a game against righty starters. This number makes no sense. I say stay away. You could get plus money to the under. I say stay away from this. This one's weird. I would have loved to have given you the over. It just makes no sense. 13 of 13, get out of here. No, stay away from Pablo Lopez today. Oakland's lefty, Ken Waldachuk, over four and a half Ks. This one's pretty heavily juiced at minus 145 at points bet sportsbook. However, Waldachuk has gone over four and a half Ks in all seven starts he's had against high K rate teams. The White Sox are averaging just over five Ks a game against lefties. Seven of the last 10 lefty starters have had at least five strikeouts against Chicago. The White Sox 21st OPS against Southpaws this year. There's a chance Waldachuk can stay in this game long enough to be able to get to five Ks. I know I mentioned how Pablo Lopez 13 of 13 in the last start or uh, in the last prop how that's fishy Ken Waldachuk's not Pablo Lopez Lopez was hired to be an ace Waldachuk is a number three number four pitcher in the rotation essentially of any other rotation if it's not Oakland it's not as fishy four and a half it's a good enough number to go try to take an over against the White Sox as long as Waldachuk of course doesn't get like the weather says that there's um a good chance of overs in this game however it's the White Sox they don't know how to score runs Waldachuk over four and a half case that's it for us here at Basis Juice, presented by PointsBet Sportsbook. I'm the Prop Queen Ariel Epstein. We'll see you again tomorrow.